Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 12, Episode 137. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Friday, Steelers Nation Day. Pittsburgh wrapping up their second week of voluntary OTAs. Pittsburgh will be back on the practice field next week for their three-day mandatory mini camp, and then they'll break and won't come back until they return to St. Vincent in late July. So, I'm happy to see football back to some degree. Uh, how you doing, Dave? Uh, I'm doing good. 100 days, Alex. We have reached the 100-day mark uh, today. 100 days until the Steelers open up their regular season on the road on September 11th against the Cincinnati Bengals. So we have reached another kind of point in the sand there. And uh, all of uh, Pittsburgh uh, uh, fandom would like to thank you for pushing the pushing the Pirates over the edge into now a, uh, a, a bit of a winning streak there because what didn't you go to the uh, one did what didn't the uh, uh, Dodgers series follow the Cardinals series or no? I think so. I mean, it was a week ago they played the Cardinals. I think there might have been some team in between there, oh, okay. but uh, yeah, I, I, I suffered through watching them lose to St. Louis. So you guys could watch them all sweep the Dodgers. There you go. And and that hasn't hadn't happened out in LA since like what? 2000. Mm-hmm. I yep. mean, that's a, that's a long time. <laughs> that's a long time coming. So I know uh, probably people listening to this are probably excited for the pirates to get back on. I think they're back on the field today, I think, but uh uh, anyway, uh, 100 days now until the uh, Steers kick off their regular season and uh, officially OTA sessions have ended, as you mentioned, mandatory mini camp uh, up next. So I guess uh, now we go over kind of what have what do we think that we have learned uh, so far through OTAs? Well, from an on-field perspective, not much, even less than I think is usual this time of year. Usually you get one or two pieces of information like we talked about an episode or two ago. You hear about some you know, unknown guy on the back end of the 90-man roster that's making some plays, a la Mike Hilton, several years ago. I don't think I've heard anything about any of those guys maybe stepping up, but obviously the, the big story the last 48 hours has been just upon two of the retirement news and the reaction now from teammates and we heard from several of his teammates including cam hayward yesterday yeah and it sounds like they weren't totally sure about this come come to find out that uh really uh i guess kind of in the last i don't know 72 hours or something along those lines is 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 you know when when they kind of had a call or whatnot you hear uh uh you know alu alu talk about just you know uh that they just kind of, kind of uh, confirming with to it, you know, is this what you want to do? And, and, you know, are you sure? And if you're happy, we're happy kind of thing. I think Cameron Hayward uh, kind of, kind of said sort of along the, the, the same lines there. Uh, you know, you, you can think that, you know, a, a person what and what you think might happen, but you don't really know what, what, what that, that person's kind of thinking there. And I think once again, this is probably, uh, it, I, I'm willing to bet that the Steelers were giving to it a lot of time and space and all uh, uh, to come to, to a decision. But I, you know, after the at this point here, I wouldn't be surprised to learn, you know, a week or two weeks or five weeks or six months from now that kind of uh, June 1st was kind of the date that they that, that they really wanted to know what would happen you know, something would happen on there. Uh, I'm willing to bet that they, they, they realized all along that there was a chance that, 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 that this could go down this way. Uh, eventually there, I think you go back to the draft and you see the team draft a, you know, defensive lineman, uh, in, in, in the third round there. I think that's another indication that at least they were making plans, uh, or, 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 you know, accepting the fact that something like this could happen with, with, with Stefan to it, uh, you know, did, did Stefan wake up, you know, a few days ago after being on the fence and saying, you know what, this is, 
this is, you know, the, the, the way I'm going to go. I nobody, I, I don't know. I, you know, you'd have to probably interview him and, and see if you could get such a question answered mm-hmm. there. Uh, and Hayward as, said it was 50, 50, according to two, he really felt right. like it could go either way, but that's, that's what Cam Hayward thought. Right. Right. I mean, he, it, it seemed to be, he was implying that to it said or felt like it was 50, 50, but I'm, mm-hmm. maybe I'm, I'm reading that incorrectly yeah and and you know and maybe that's to it just being cordial you know uh uh you know maybe and maybe he didn't even really come to a firm decision until after the fact you know there 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 are obviously the reports that he was back at notre dame uh getting his you know getting his degree and that that was something that was very important to him and and maybe after getting that maybe you know maybe he sat back and said you know what uh i you know Football, I don't want football to define what I do. I, I want to go down this path now, you know, and all like that. Who, whoever knows uh, and, and however he, he reached reached to his decision is his business at this point. And, you know, obviously, as we, we indicated the other day during the podcast, the emergency episode that we did there, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I don't see how I understand from a fan standpoint how you'd be upset and and man, I wish this would have happened earlier and all like that. But uh, once again, I don't think that the Steelers are backdoored in this situation. And I and I wouldn't even think it's, you know, that they were as surprised maybe as as was the case with the whole D- David DeCastro thing, you know, Uh especially looking back at the way that draft went, you know, uh, over a year ago there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think the Steelers were blindsided by this one bit. I just think that it, it, it probably got to the point that, they had to have a decision on this by about this time because now you're you're out of OTAs and you're getting into the mandatory mini camp portion and mandatory mini camp is mandatory that you attend. So uh, you know, with, with just a few days ahead of that happening, I, I would imagine that this has kind of been the line in the sand. Uh, if, if, if you will, for, for for quite some time now. And uh, look, there, uh, you know, the my initial reaction to all this as soon as. Uh, as soon as the official word came out the other day uh, and, and we saw stuff on to it's retiring, but my, my first reaction, to this was, Oh, you know what, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because I did to me, uh, uh, this is a big loss because I, I was really hoping that this was going to be a stuff on to it. Once again, uh, at least 80% of the stuff on to it that we saw in 2020 and knowing what this defensive line uh, went through last year, uh, and knowing that, yeah, you are getting back a Tyson Aluwalu, but he's another year older. Uh, you know, you got a lot of question marks down that depth chart. Yeah, we saw some nice things from Isaiah Loudermilk as the season pro- progressed, but uh, he, he, you know, there's the the the, the jury's obviously still out on him. Uh, the rookie's going to have his set of rookie growing pains. You hope that you don't get into a spot where you have to play him more than, let's say, you did uh, an Isaiah Loudermilk last year. Do we really know what Montrevious Adams is at this point, and maybe where how much how much uh, further he can uh, progress? Uh, uh, you got a guy like Wormley who's. You know, really, the, a lot of onus now goes on on Chris Wormley because you would think now this is the guy that's going to have to inherit a, a, a lot more of those snaps like he did last year uh, uh, you know, without to it, without, uh, you know, Alu Alu in there. So uh, to me, it went from a situation of really being hopeful of, of, of Stefan to it being back and really being optimistic, you know, to some degree to now kind of not being, you know, having a more kind of pessimistic view, if you will, uh, now that we know that he's not coming back. Sure. I mean, obviously it's a big loss. There's no other way to try to spin or justify or, or rationalize it. And and having to it back would have been, you know, arguably the biggest quote unquote acquisition this team could have made this, this whole off season. But I still think and expect this defensive line to be better than where it was last year. I think it's a more talented group, a more experienced group, and hopefully won't be hit by all the injuries that it was hit by 
last year. And so I still think it's reasonable to believe this will be an improved unit overall. Even if you look at the off-ball linebacker group, that should be better than where it was a year ago. And this unit is still capable of being maybe not an elite run defense, not uh, the, the group it could have been with Stefan to it, but a top 10 run defense unit overall. One of the questions I have is just how do you replace some of that pass rush production that two it had. Now, Wormley did a good job last year, had seven sacks, but he, you don't get the high from Chris Wormley that you got from Stefan too. You won't get that from, from anybody unless Leal turns out to be an amazing player. And so that to me is the, the thought there. I have a video that's going to go up Saturday morning on Steelers Depot that breaks down Isaiah Loudemoke and how he can improve his pass rush because that's something, an area where he really lacked last year and really has lacked throughout his college career. And look, I mean, you go back to if Tyson Alualo can be that guy that he was where he kind of left off at, uh, you know, not so much last year because we didn't get to see a whole heck of a lot of him last year. But uh, if he can be that guy that he was in in, 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 in 2020, uh, you know, although you're not going to ask, you know, yeah, he's going to play in some sub package situations, but there's going to be a, a, a fairly healthy rotation. One would think when it comes to, you know, guys playing in, in uh, the two down linemen in the sub package situation. But uh, let me go. I mean, you know, that guy was terrorizing centers and guards in 2020. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, to the point where, I mean, uh, legitimately Tyson Alu Alu extended his career by kicking inside like he did with the Steelers there, because I remember after that first contract was up with him kind of wondering, eh, I don't know, you know, should, should they resign him? Uh, should they not? I mean, but they resigned him and, and he, he, he put some of his best football, I think was, has been, uh, of his career has been since he signed that second contract, uh, with the Steelers there. Uh, Undoubtedly, though, this team cannot afford to have an Alu Alu or a Cameron Hayward go down this season. And I think that's a captain obvious uh, statement. Sure. Uh, you want to you know, have your, your top guys, your starters, especially Hayward, obviously. But Alu Alu, I mean, again, I, I know the guy's, what, 35, going on 36. But as you said, when this guy's been healthy, his play's been excellent. He found the fountain of youth. And there's a very strong correlation between his availability and his health and how good of a run defense Pittsburgh has when he's out there and he's healthy the last two years, he's been excellent. And the Steelers run defense has been excellent and that's not all on him, but he's certainly the man in the middle. And that's where the issue started last year. Pittsburgh had so many issues last year, but it really, to me, started up front in that middle at no tackle. Once you lost all Alu in week two against Oakland, you never had a replacement until you brought on Adams very late in the season. They tried to play Mondo inside. Uh, Bugs was a mess in the middle. They had to try to kick him Hayward there to try to get some stability at that position, which showed how desperate they were. And so really all your ills to me began at no stack last year. So having him back, having Adams back with a full off season are really big benefits. Yeah. Look, you know, uh, Adams coming in, that guy was behind the eight ball in November, right? You know, and for him, by, by no stretch of any imagination, did 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 Montrevious Adams set the world on fire uh, when he arrived in Pittsburgh. But there was enough there, enough positive there uh, that to, to me and, and, and you know, we talked about this going into the offseason that we thought it was pretty much a slam dunk that Montrevious Adams would be re-signed. And he was and it was a two year deal on top of there. So there was enough there that that at least from a backup guy at least when it comes to 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 that uh, that, that position specifically kind of that that nose tackle slash defensive tackle uh guy that that you would like to think that you have enough there inside uh with with Tyson Aluado and Montrevious Adams and push comes to shove both of them are versatile versatile enough where you needed to kick one outside in the in, in in a base defense for some help in a game. You could. I don't think you want to do it on. I don't think you want to see it on a on a game by game basis there. But they do have the versatility to do it. And with with mm-hmm. with Montradius having enough time in that in the in the organization now having a full off season, uh, you would hope that you know there's going to be at least a little bit more development from from what his skill set will allow right now a guy like Isaiah Loudermilk I mean uh, you want to talk about uh, at least in my eyes one of the one of the bigger surprises uh last year was a not how not uh, was was a not only how much he played but I, I, I there was some development there especially on the run on on the run defending side 
uh, I thought. Now you said you're going to show a little bit more from a from a pass rush standpoint where he needs to improve, and and absolutely because if you don't have a guy like Tuit in there, you got to have somebody help try to pick up some of that slack because I don't think you're going to expect Wormley to play 800 snaps over there. You know, sure. Uh, on, on top of it, there. So, uh, and then there's Wormley. Can this guy kind of pick up where he left off? And 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 I think he said he's gained like what seven or eight pounds or something like like that. So it would be nice to kind of see him with a little bit more sand in his pants and 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 you know yet another uh, season underneath his belt in that defense and. They're going to rely a lot on Chris Wormley now that this year, this year, this, this is a year for Chris Wormley to, to either catapult himself into, uh, you know, a, a really, really nice contract here or for him to put himself with one foot out of the league. Let's just kind of map out, assuming everyone stays healthy, which is a dangerous game to play considering what happened last year, but let's assume that, um, in terms of three down fronts and two down fronts, because that's really the way the NFL works these days. You know, how many guys, it's not it's a little less about three, four versus four, three, but you know, what's how many guys down uh, in the front are there? So your three man front, your three, four defense, uh, you'll have uh, warmly at left defensive end, Hayward, right defensive end, Alu Alu starting nose tackle, and then kind of your backups there. Loudamoke is your rotational defensive end, and then Adams is going to be your rotational nose tackle. Is that kind of a good way to? Sum up those roles. That would be that would be my top five as we sit here now. And then obviously uh, the time that louder milk, I think, gets in sub package depends on how he progresses as a pass rusher. Sure. And I was going to bring that to a two down front, your nickel, your dime package, your your sub package football. Hayward warmly is going to be part of that. Alu Alu, and that's where I think Leal has the best chance to sign, uh, shine. Obviously, those guys are going to play in different formations, and Leal will play as a base on occasionally, but um, he's going to do his best work as that sub package pass rusher. Yeah, that's probably where, where you're going to ask him to cut his teeth, right? Because let, let's face it, and this is something else that I, I, I think is going to get glossed over a little bit here. Uh, it, it's going to be a challenge for him for the rest of this off season, not only to, to, Oh, I'm in the NFL. Now I'm having to learn a new system, learn this defense, uh, 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 make, make just a, the, the, uh, adjusting to just a new league, you know, a, a, everything that goes along with the jump, but not only that, he's having to gain weight on top of it and learn how to play at a, heavier weight and learn how to properly take care of his body on a week to week basis. So there's a lot on him, you know, as there is obviously with most rookies, but there's a lot on him because of having to gain the weight on top of it and, and learn to play that way. And I don't think you can just brush under uh, brush under the carpet. The fact that, Oh, he's just got to uh, gain 15 pounds and, mm-hmm. and, and all, all, off he goes, you know, right. You're right. Uh, he has to learn how to play at that weight. Now right. Too. You're right. right. And, and I think too many people are just taking it for granted that, you know, you just get on weight gain 3000 and, uh, and, and, and off you go, you know, but, but, uh, and I think, uh, didn't Wormley kind of one of them kind of, I think it was Wormley to kind of hit on that yesterday in his interview and, and really got me kind of thinking about that is he's got to learn how to play at that heavier weight and all. And I think that's going to take some time and we would agree that he's a better pass rusher than he is a run defender right now. Right. Yes. That's why I view him as more of the sub package guy. Again, he'll play everything. Um, but Primarily, I think his role will be to get after the quarterback. So, I mean, you could you could carve out, you know, assuming he's active, you could probably carve out uh, easily without injuries alone. Probably what a hundred snaps on the season for him uh, 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 rushing from the sub packet situation. Yeah, in terms of that alone, maybe. And again, I'm very, I'm speaking very broadly here. Obviously, a lot of your, you know, you're, you're sub package most of the time, so you're going to be playing a run against, you know, against defenses or, or when you're in facing eleven personnel, I should say. So, I mean, I'm speaking very broadly here. It's not just, you know, he's only going to be playing on passing downs, quote right. unquote. So, I just want to be clear about that. But yeah, I don't know exactly how the snap count's going to look. It'll be partly just based on how he looks and plays and performs and handles the weight increase and. Uh, making the jump to the NFL, but that's, I think, going to be his role playing the three tech and nickel and dime packages and getting after the quarterback. 
but you know, primarily, what is what is what is your base? I mean, what is your uh, sub package kind of rotation of three going to look like? You, you know, obviously just two down, but that that is probably going to work through primarily three players in totality. Yeah, like I mentioned, that's why I was kind of going through Hayward, Wormley, Leal, and I think you can get some uh, snaps from Alu Alu uh, there as well. Right, and I what I think that you don't want to do is get in a situation where you're having to play Alu Alu. 40 snaps a game, you know, uh, along those lines, you, you obviously want them in there in base and you want to be able to keep them fresh enough too, where you can get some occasional, uh, series of, of, uh, of, uh, sub package snaps from him. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's good to have him as the one tech and sub. Cause again, you are going to be, you know, facing the run obviously sure. in those situations as well. So, I mean, again, we're just talking top of the depth chart. All these guys are going to rotate in and out of all of these packages and situations, but kind of where you start to me, that's the way that I look at it. Who is the next one outside of that, that top, uh, how many are, are we up to here? Uh, uh, well, there's six total six. That we're referencing. Yeah, right. you're, you're asking the next in, who, in what regard? Who, 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 who is who is seven? Um, I guess right now Henry Henry Mondo, just based on the experience that he has and the special teams value that he's capable of providing. Very rarely do you see a defense lineman able to run down kicks, and that's a guy that can do it. So obviously, his play as a defense lineman has been poor. He's not a no stack. Well, Pittsburgh tried their best to play him in the middle last year, and that did not work, but he'll be seven, I suppose. Okay. Uh, and, you know, obviously right now, and we talked about this the other day, everybody's trying to uh, uh, get this team to sign er- everyone under the sun right now. And I think uh, after our talk the other day, I think on, on now on Friday morning, you have a nice article up about uh, who realistically are the choices that this team could and we use that dangerously could because i'm not convinced they're going to do anything at all mm-hmm. uh at least until they get through through uh mandatory mini camp uh of who they might be interested in signing yeah if the they, names if we, they sign any at all right the names we had mentioned on the emergency podcast nick williams sheldon richardson uh williams is going to be probably more the run stuffer the cheaper option richardson a bit more of the pass rusher athletic type of guy with maybe a touch more versatility as well. Also uh, good to note that Carl Dunbar was Richardson's D line coach in New York uh, in 2014, 2015. So a little dot connecting there, but again, will they make a move? Maybe Um, it's not probably going to be the big, big names people are talking about, but those are two that seem the most sensible. All right. Uh, I, I, I definitely agree there. And for the people, uh, apology to the uh, Eddie Goldman people, but I, I just don't see the value in bringing in a primarily a, a nose tackle, defensive tackle type guy at this point. At, at, at any point, have you thought, boy, you know, Eddie Goldman would be good kind of out there uh, 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 further away from 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 the zero one or the two? Yeah, not really. He's a good player. I thought he played well he against Pittsburgh last year. Both There's, those guys, Hicks right. and Goldman, did well. Right. There's been times where I thought, well, you know what? Eddie Goldman, that, that might be the you know, guy that you could have in the future in, uh, uh, up the middle there. But, I mean, this this team already has Alu Alu and, 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 and Montrevious Adams to be those kind of guys. So, barring an injury to one of those two guys, I don't, you know, people have star Lolo to Lely on list and all like that. Uh they don't need another nose tackle, defensive tackle type. What they need is mm-hmm. they need that 302 pound, six foot four, six foot five, six foot six guy that could uh, 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 give them some some steps out on the edge. Yeah, need more of a three tech, four eye kind of guy. That's more the end type they're looking for. I like the name that you mentioned, not for this year, but next year. A reunion with Javon Hargrave would be <laughs> fan freaking tastic. Well, a lot of people uh, that that. That one got some retweets and some likes, mm-hmm. didn't it? Uh, mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people didn't look at the date on there. Uh, it's 2023, uh, people. Uh, uh, and for those that think, well, why not trade for him now? I just think it's contract the way it is and the, uh, the, the, the way the Eagles have, have redone his deal and all. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense at all. Uh, for them to and and people say okay well what about Fletcher Cox well Fletcher Cox is in the same situation there because essentially they signed Fletcher Cox like a one year they caught him and then 
uh, I think made him like a post June. It, it was weird what they did with him, but they did it with purpose. And essentially it's a one year, $14 million deal for Fletcher Cox. And there's got a lot of void years on that. So why would you go for through that rigmarole uh, of getting him to that kind of specific deal uh, just to trade him away? You know, it, it, uh, and, and have the dead money uh, out of the shoot, you know, with that. So, the, so, uh, yeah, I understand that maybe, you know, there were reports. What was it last year that the Steelers might be interested in Fletcher Cox? Uh, I, I don't see it. And I don't see the Eagles parting ways with him at this point, based on what, the, what, what they have done with his contract. Uh, as far as Javon Hargrave goes, that's another instance where, uh, they have done some things with his contract. He's got some voidable years on, uh, on there. Now he has a base salary due this year, a 12.75 million uh, Alex, and then, I mean, he's got proration out the yin-yang on top of that running through 2025. Uh, so, A, uh, from a from a salary standpoint alone in 2022, there's no way the Steelers are going to take on a $12.75 million uh, contract with him. And I, uh, you know, to and and people are saying, well, why not uh, get him in and restructure his, his and do the void years? Well, I think we've already been told that those void that void year process was a one year deal with the Steelers mm -hmm. that uh, mechanism there. So I would not expect them to do anything like that. And then once again, when you look at the dead money aspect of that, that the Eagles will be dealing with here. Uh, I mean, yeah, his, his contract, they're going to have dead money regardless with him. If they don't resign him next year, the, you know, because his contract set to void in Feb February there. So uh, they've already set themselves up for, for, for some dead money uh, there with Hargrave. Now, if, if, if you got him for a, a, a swan song later, to, you know, if it only costs you like a fifth round draft pick or something to bring Javon Hargrave back in the fold, well, then, as Omar Khan said, you find ways to make that that twelve point seven five million dollars work. I just don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and the reason, you know, uh, the reason I even looked into and, and put that out there on Twitter is because people kept saying, well, what about Javon Hargrave trading for him? So I went and looked at his contract. And after looking at it, looking at the void dates and all like that, I thought, hey, you know, this is a guy that more than likely is going to hit unrestricted free agency next March. Uh I could really see him coming back. I mean, I, I, I think it's plausible to think about Javon Hargrave re-signing with the Steelers next March. Sure. Um, member of Pittsburgh, they didn't want to let him go. They just really couldn't afford him. They had other you know guys to sign and other obligations. And if they expand his role and get him more of a snap count than what he had the first time around, which they probably could, um, I'd be all for that. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Because, look, you're not going to have Tyson Alualo pass this year, right? right. Uh, uh, Montrevious Adams, uh, uh, what happens in 2023 when Montrevious Adams will be decided by how Montrevious Adams plays in 2022. So uh, that, quite honestly, that could go either way with him uh, as we sit here today. Uh, you know, this team, you could realistically see this team go back into the offseason uh, next year, needing not only a nose tackle slash defensive tackle, but another defensive end as well, too. So why wouldn't you address one of those potentially through a player that you know and know well in, 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 in Javon Hargrave? Now, will it work out perfectly like this? I don't know. But I, I, I think I, I could see I could set up circumstances like I just did where it would make sense and it'd be very plausible for Javon Hargrave to be back in the Steelers' sights next March. Sure, and I'd, again, I'd be all for it, and Pittsburgh will have the cap space to do it, but he will not mm -hmm. come cheap, just to make that clear, that it is going to be an expensive contract to sign. Uh, let's see, his average yearly value right now is uh, $13 million. I would expect it to click down uh, from there, I mean, who knows? This, this guy could go out and get. Yeah, he just made a Pro Bowl last year, yeah. so I don't know if it'll take down. Yeah, so uh, it, 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 you know, maybe maybe you maybe you maybe uh, maybe you looking around. I don't know, ten million. I don't know, but uh, the Steelers should be in a, a position where if, if if they deemed him as a guy they want to go back after again, uh, uh, they should be able to do it. 
Yeah, so I think it's a good suggestion to to file away for next year. But so, that's 2023, but, right. people. So don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, don't don't get it. I mean, would it be nice if, if you could trade for him now? I just I just kind of wonder about that 12.75 million salary for starters. And second, I kind of wonder if, if if the Eagles really at this point uh, you want to eat that much dead money. You know, and right? They're, they're, and are, are they willing to? It to make a trade. They, they, right. they want to win. They're in a you know division that's certainly winnable for them. So they may not want to be looking to move guys out right now. Right. Right. I mean, is there anybody else around the league that you could maybe see this team trading for? I mean, I, I, I hadn't I, looked at a list, yeah. but I mean, there's probably a couple of names we could talk about, but again, I think what they're going to do, maybe they sign some mid level, low level free agent, but I think they want to take the guys they have on the roster right now, go to camp, see how they look. It's a lot of young guys, see how the young guys perform, loud and Oakley, Al, et cetera, and then go from there. Um, and then it, that's when they would make any trade. That's typically what Colbert would do in August, late August is kind of whenever the, the sure. trades start to occur. Right. And look, I mean, we've seen it time and time again over and we'll see if Omar does the same thing here, but I mean, during that final, final week of cut down at all, we could have as many as three new Steelers on the roster from, the time the final preseason game ends till the week one roster is, is, is finalized there. So uh, I, I think this team will obviously look as they do every year at cut downs and maybe potential trade options and, 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 and those kind of things there. Uh, I don't think they're done, you know, uh, at least I hope not, especially on, I think on the defensive side of the football at, at, at this point here, look, Nick Williams. I know people, I know that that sound like a really overall sexy name uh, at, at, at this point, but man, if you could get that guy for, you know, uh, even at $1.5 million to come in and, and, and compete for a roster spot, why wouldn't you, you know, uh, that's a guy that I think knows the culture. Uh, I think he can help a push, obviously give you some injury protect protection. And if he doesn't win a spot, he doesn't win the spot, you know, and, but, but maybe he's enough guy, especially with these new practice, you know, with these practice squad rules kind of remaining the same, if you will, uh, you can have a veteran on your practice squad now. So maybe, uh, maybe Nick Williams is no longer a 53 man roster guy, but maybe he is a, <laughs> Uh, 56 man roster guy, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And, and, and that aspect there, I don't think you can have, uh, I've said this several times, Alex. I mean, if you would sign a minimum salary benefit contract, I'm, I'd be willing to see what you have, uh, during, during camp, you know, uh, well, I am willing just to I, let you know, I, well, I wouldn't put you in there. I don't think I'd put you in any, uh, backs on backers drills or anything like that, but I, mm, I, I, I get I, the tree archer treatment. I'd okay. Winner with the receivers. Yeah. Abs absolutely. But, uh, I don't think you can have too many experienced guys competing for roster spots. Uh, and I, and, if you could have a guy like Nick Williams or really Sheldon Richardson for, for that point from, from your suggestion as well, too. If you could have one of those guys for less than $3 million, bring it on, man. Bring them mm -hmm. to camp, you know? Right, because you do want to have some depth and some injury protection because you have six guys right now who are projected to almost you know safely make the roster. But what if one of those guys goes down the way that happened last year? Then you're counting on we're back to Mondo and unknown guys trying to fit into those roles, and that's going to get – difficult and dicey the way that it did in 2021. So you'd like to have that seventh guy to feel like if there is an injury, you know, you're not scrambling. And I, you know, I, I don't know how to what degree, but I think uh, Chris Adamski from the Trib reported late last night that Wormley confirmed to him that he did not go through drills during OTAs because he's dealing with quote unquote something. So uh, I don't know what that something is. Uh, it doesn't sound you know, overly serious or whatnot, but, uh, uh, the idea that you're going to have those, those top six guys go through every practice set, you know, mm -hmm. a, 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 a during training camp is, is probably fooling yourself to some degree there. So, uh, I, I think they, I think we could maybe after OTAs, we'll see how this thing plays out, especially on into training camp here, maybe see a veteran guy on the cheap be, be added to the, uh, to the group, if you will. I believe Adamski termed it as minor. I don't know if those were okay. his words or Wormley's words, but you know, can't say for sure exactly what that looks like, but that is a, a good point to, to pass along. All right. Uh, all right. We'll see. Uh, and, and the team has now, as of yesterday, officially placed stuff on to it on the reserve retired list. So they now officially have a uh, one roster spot open. 
and we'll see. You know, d- d- does a guy like the uh, who do who they cut the other day? The uh, uh, Trevon Mason. Mason. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Mason circles back. Maybe they have somebody else in mind. Uh, I'd like to see him add another one of those edge, right? You know, that uh, 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 who, who was the Vikings uh, kid? Uh, say it. Odin Igbo. Okay. Still yeah. working on it. A little better uh, than I was last show. I'd like to see them, add, say, see them add him to the fold more so than I would another defensive lineman at this point, to be honest with right. you. Right. They have the open roster spot right now still, so we'll see how right. they fill it. You had the interesting tweet yesterday, um, just looking big picture about to it in that 2014 draft class about all the what ifs. That is oh, the 2014 man. draft class is the class of what if Ryan Chazier, Stefan to it, Tree Archer, Martavis Bryant, your top four guys there. Um, and you had careers cut short with Chazier, with to it, and with Bryant, all for different reasons, of course, but three immensely talented players who did not get to really see their career till the, uh, the very end. Man, and and the way I term that too, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It's a bit sobering when you when you pull this up, you look at it in its totality. Here, is that could that be the uh, the top quote unquote if only draft class of, of Kevin Colbert's career as, as the Steelers GM? I mean, Ryan. I mean, there there when you look at Shazier to it. And Martavis Bryant alone, there was a good six month span for each of those players where uh, of their careers where you thought, oh, man, you know, th- these guys, you know, all pro uh, pro bowl for 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 numerous amount of years. You know, mm-hmm. now, now I, you know, they probably didn't overlap during during because obviously uh, even to it, you know, uh, a little bit before is his 2020 season, but I mean, it's 2020 specifically that season made you think, Oh my God. Well, I mean, th- this guy could be around another six or seven years, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then obviously Ryan Sh- Shazier, um, uh, about the time that he got injured, you know, he was at, he was really starting to come into his own at, at, at the inside linebacker position there. So, uh, obviously injury, uh, injury, unfortunately injury, Cut his cut short his career instantly. Martavis Bryant cut his own career short. Uh, there was a time, Alex, where I thought maybe Martavis Bryant was was going to be the next Randy Moss. I mean, right? He, uh, he won Rookie of the Year. He won the Joe Green Award that year. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a time where you thought that man, this guy could be become the the best deep deep threat in the NFL. You know, right? And then we saw how kind of he, you know, uh, 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 imploded in his career. Uh, Dre Archer. I mean, I, uh, I, I don't think there was ever a point, other than maybe that training camp as rookie season, where maybe you thought, oh man, well, you know, m- m- maybe they have a little something there. But you know, just obviously too small, and and being more running back than he was wide receiver. I, you know, obviously. W- you know, nothing ever became of that. Shaquille Richardson didn't didn't Carnell Lake kind of have a big hand and kind of recruit him because wasn't Shaquille Richardson a guy that was originally I think kind of recruited it used to UCLA, but then ended up going to Arizona. I forget how that worked out there, but I think but I think Carnell Lake and that was a guy that that they just never got anything out of right out of the shoot. Right, he didn't make the team out of camp or, or, or I think he was on the practice squad. or something, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I think he was dealing with something, but it never worked out. You're right. He did uh, originally attend UCLA, or at least enroll, but then got dismissed as a freshman and went to Arizona. And so one of those mid-round cornerback misses that became so common during Colbert's tenure. And Wesley Johnson was a, was, uh, uh, out of Vanderbilt was uh, a guy that you thought, okay, well, this guy has position flexibility. And he actually went on to play a couple of games for like the Jets or. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got uh, claimed by the Jets. Yeah. Uh, one of those teams there, you know, obviously he's washed out since then there. Uh, so I don't want to say that, you know, that was a huge what if uh, kind of guy there, but he was a what if guy as, as far as maybe this is a guy that could have stuck on your roster you know, for two or three years as, 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 as an interior kind of backup guy, Jordan Wood, Zoom Walt, a uh, good special teamer, but just never could could stay healthy. Uh, Danny Money Mc- pit. Money yeah. pit they call it. <laughs> Actually, Zoom Walt, I'm not making fun of him. Uh, is hurt right now. He's a broken jaw. He broke his jaw the other day. Did he really? Yeah, apparently, because I, I follow him on Instagram whenever he was drafted. I've just never unfollowed him, but apparently he was sick, had the flu. And these are his words from a, an Instagram post. Um, he was like, middle of the night, was sick, 
tried to go back to his bedroom, passed out while he was walking there, hit his oh, head and broke his jaw. No. So like just the worst injury luck in the world ever. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And that it seemed like that guy at the wrong time is all, you know, camp or, you know, preseason just always, uh, if had he been able to stay healthy, he could have been, um, oh, Tyler Mat- Matikavich for a few years, I think, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Daniel McCullers, obviously, you know, uh, trying to take a mammoth of a guy and, uh, convert him that, he hung on a lot longer than what I envisioned. <laughs> <laughs> really had this unusual staying power where I could never quite figure out. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, probably one of the, the, the biggest what ifs I will remember about uh, 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 this class was Rob Blanchflower out of Massachusetts. Uh, baby Gronk or whatever you want to call him, you know, uh, coming out, you kind of wondered, man, if and, and this is a, a Rob Blanchflower that I think went through a hernia situation mm-hmm. there during his last season at Massachusetts and uh, that kind of dampered down his, his stock and all like that. Cause I, if memory serves me going back uh, into, into kind of his final year there, they thought, Oh man, what, you know, watch out for this Rob Blanche flower kid, but then just could, couldn't stay healthy and then got to the NFL level and couldn't stay healthy. Uh, you always, I'll at least, you know, until you come washed out, which it didn't take long for that to happen. I always thought that, man, may, maybe they got a, fi- a finder in the seventh round, you know, but he was another one that just nothing ever materialized with him whatsoever. But I mean, even if you go back and you boil down this 2000, uh, this, this draft class to Ryan Shazier, stuff on to it and Martavis Bryant. I mean, there was a point there where you thought, like, like I said, for, 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 for at least a good six month span for all three of those players, we thought, Oh man, they they really got something here mm-hmm. uh, uh, with these. You could argue very convincingly that this was the most talented draft class Kevin Colbert ever took, and he's had some really good ones, but it just never quite materialized for a lot of unfortunate reasons. I will say, Martavis Brown, I believe the only guy on this list still playing football. He is mm. not part of the fan controlled football league, the same league that Johnny Menzel I think is playing in, and so he's still. I don't know what his plans are. I don't know if he ever wants to try to re- re- reapply to, to come back to the NFL, but he's still playing football. How how, how old is he now? Is he like 30? 30? 30. Let's see what Wikipedia says. Yeah, 30. He'll be 31 in December. Okay. I mean, if had, had he kept his nose clean and all, I mean, he, he'd still be in the league right now, you would think, right? Or if he had come into the league, say, now, when they don't suspend you for weed anymore, mm. then he probably would have been good that way. So, obviously, all he had to do was just not fail drug tests, and he would have been a superstar. Um, but had he just entered the league a couple of years later, it might have been a moot point. Let's see. How many uh, during his uh, career with Steelers there? Uh, 126 receptions for 1,917 yards, 17 touchdowns. Uh, yards per target, 8.6 while he was with the Steelers and yards per reception with the Steelers, 15.2 on. What was his rookie year? Like 21 yards per catch. I think. Yeah. 21.1. And remember he didn't re- you remember right. the whole thing with him. Cause I, 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 I forget what he bumped his knee early on in the process or something like that. And you kept and the big talk back then is when they going to get Martavis Bryant on the field, uh, uh, and, and all, and he finally did. When was it? Like week seven, week eight versus week the Texans? Six, I think. seven, yeah, yep. And he and, and he had two receptions, I think, in that game, and a touchdown. And then, uh, I mean, it's just like a touchdown or two every 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 week from from there on out. And that you know, uh, yeah, you just you you kind of thought once you got him over that hump in week seven or whatnot, his rookie season. Like, okay, yeah, they got something here, and. It, it just didn't go that way, but uh, I don't know. I, I I just last night pulled that up, and you you look at that uh, that that draft class in totality, and get get you kind of depressed. <laughs> mm. At least Pittsburgh yeah. got a third for Brian. I still can't believe the Raiders oh, traded man. a third, and Pittsburgh didn't want to deal him. But basically, what happened was the Raiders kept upping their offer and just mm-hmm. increasing what they would give, and eventually, Corbett said, "Listen, we can't pass on this," and obviously, it proved to be the right decision. Right, right, absolutely. So anyway, uh, one of the I, I don't know if that's the biggest, uh, if only, cl- uh, class of Kevin Colbert's career, but if it's not, it's right up there. I don't know what would top it. I've gone right. through the, these draft classes in my Colbert ranking exercise, and I can't think of one in terms of the what ifs that is going to top that group. I mean, just look at Stefan Tuitt, uh, uh, single him out alone. 
you know, especially coming off that 2020 season. What what if all that tragic stuff didn't happen to him last summer? You know, right. yeah, I mean, in, in theory, quote unquote, Ryan Chazier and Stefan too, it should still be playing right now mm-hmm. and be part of a, a just an amazing Steelers defense. Right. Because you probably wouldn't have had you. You obviously wouldn't have had a need to draft uh, Devin Bush. Uh, I mean, you, you changed the whole space time continuum. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've reached that point of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We have. Uh, all right. But uh, anyway, Devin, I, I, I look back at that yesterday and I figured maybe that'd be worth worth talking about today. Yeah, it's a heck of a class. It's just unfortunate for all those reasons that those guys aren't uh, playing football anymore. But again, you, you respect Toot's decision. It's the best one for him, for his family. And, you know, selfishly, I had hoped that Toot would return. I think most Steelers fans, even Cam Hayward, said as much. But, you know, he's got to do what's best for him. And, you know, I, I don't want to put this thought out there so so soon, but is it possible a year from now with Toot says, maybe I want to come back to football? I, I won't say that's a 0% thing. <sighs> I, I, I mean, we're all guessing. We right. have no idea, but that, that it happened that, before with other guys. Right. That that part of it hasn't entered my entered my thought process right now. To be honest with you, uh, okay. at no at, my. At, at no point have I ha, have I has that run a, across my mind until you just said it there. So, uh, is it is it 100 percent? No, that's not going to happen. I mean, I don't think anybody can say that. Uh, but. You know, obviously, you would bet that that's not going to happen. I mean, sure. I guess it's one of those things that you cross your bridge when it gets to it. Now, it obviously would have to be at a lot at a lot lower lower salary, and with him going on a reserve retired list, you'd still own the rights to him, right? Uh, you know, on, on on top of it there. So, uh, and but if it did happen, I would expect it to happen at a at a much lower uh, cost. But I don't know, just kind of looking back at Stefan to it and, and how he's kind of progressed and, you know, uh, uh, in dealings, you know, as a human being, uh, with the media and all like that. Uh, I have a feeling that he's got much greater things in, 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 in store for himself at this point here, you know, sure. Some, I, I, I think it's cause likely. or something like that. I think he's going to go on to other things and I don't think he's going to look back at his football career and say, what if, you know, no, I understand. Um, and, and I think it's more likely than not that he stays retired, but you never know. He did. I mean, he, it sounds like it was he could have gone either way. According to Kim Haywood, it wasn't like he was 100 percent. I'm retiring. I have no desire to come back to football. Certainly there was a pull to that. And you never know. You get into, you know, the fall and, and you're sitting at home for the first time in a while, not being, you know, part of that actual team, even though last year he wasn't playing, but still on, on, on the roster, part of the, the Steelers, maybe that that feeling changes a bit. I don't know. This is all obviously speculation for me. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah. At this point, those, most of the Steelers fan, most people listen to this podcast, probably saying uh, good riddance, ready to wash, you know, wash your hands of them and all like that. But uh, uh, I'll just end the conversation this way. Uh, and, and, and that's why I said, you know, uh, uh, n- near the top of it there. Once, once that news officially broke there, I thought, the, the defensive line did not get better as a result of Stefan to deciding to retire the sure. 2020 two version uh, of it. It, 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 you know, uh, you're, you're either getting better or you're going worse. I'm, I'm not a believer uh, in anything staying the same at any given moment. So at any given moment, you're either going in a more positive direction or in a negative direction. And I view the uh, result of the stuff on to it retirement as this Steelers defensive front going in a negative direction. Of course. I don't know how you could argue that it's a positive here to it is, you know, you much rather have him than not have him, but that's his decision. You respect it. And, and at least there's an answer now and you know right. where things stand and you can move on. Absolutely. All right, Dave, some other news here. Pittsburgh busy in the uh, Omar Khan uh, first couple weeks as a Steelers general manager. I guess oh, actually this first is, week. This is the, portion where you dunk right mm. uh, uh, I, i'll be a more i'll do a layup i won't i okay. won't be a, too aggressive with a dunk well let's start with a couple of the moves here um we mentioned i guess on one of the shows about rick reprish right did we talk about rick reprish no longer with the team man i don't remember i think we did but uh well let's re- recap, recap it again yeah uh rick reprish no longer with the steelers um long time uh senior scout really become an area scout for the team in the in the south southeast been with the team for 
believe he was going into year nine, so spent eight years. Um, he's been in football since 1979, so he may be very close to retirement. Uh, spent a lot of time with the Saints and a lot of experience down south. And so Rapriche is gone. Brandon Hunt, of course, officially gone as well. He'll go to Philadelphia for a role that I'm still not sure what that is. Have the Eagles announced anything on Brandon Hunt? Do you know? I don't, I don't think they have. I don't think I've seen anything on, the, on their Let media Let me see side. if on their uh, – Eagles page if they post it because sometimes these moves get announced and no one really ever talks about them uh, publicly. Now I'm not seeing Brandon Hunt listed on the Steeler or the Eagles uh, team site yet, so we'll keep it posted on what that official title may be. Uh, longtime scout Bruce McNorton is no longer with the team as well. His name's been erased from the Steelers team website, so he was brought in with Kevin Colbert back in 2000. He was in Detroit when Colbert got hired and brought along, and so a guy that we didn't really see too much of over the years. Pretty rare that I saw Bruce McNorton on the scouting trail, so I don't really know if I just didn't see him or if he had some other kind of different role or what exactly that was, but he'd been uh, with a team for as long as Kevin Colbert. And then the news that came in yesterday from Neil Stratton via inside the league, not been made official by the team, but reportedly the Steelers were hiring Mark Sadowski in a quote executive role in the Steelers front office. He was most previously the uh, college scouting director in Chicago, had been with the Bears for, I think, about 15 years, but got pushed out as a new GM Ryan Pace puts his guys in place. And so that's a name Sadowski. We had mentioned several times, Omar Khan and him are very good friends. They were at Tulane together. Khan first uh, got Sadowski his first NFL job in New Orleans. And so those two have had a really close relationship. And so that's a name that we talked about. And that is my quote unquote dunk of the day. Yeah. No, not so much. Uh, we, I mean, you, uh, you put it out there on, on like, I don't know, March 24th or, tw- or May 24th, May 26th, right around in there. And I think you got some pushback and <laughs> you could, uh, I, I was proud to go back and look at some of you, you, uh, uh, you completed a couple of dunks on some people <laughs> in, uh, in that, in that Twitter thread from, uh, from, from a couple of weeks ago. So good job by you on, 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 on connecting the dots on that. And I, I don't know, we'll get a formal announcement uh, from the Steelers on that. Uh, it'll probably just show up on the, uh, 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 you know, right. our, 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 on, on the website, on the front office page and all like that. I'm looking at the Eagles me- media back end of their, their site as well, too. I'm not seeing any changes uh, when it comes to Brandon Hunt or anything like that as well, too. So I think uh, you, you think this is kind of, we've, we've seen the washout of all this now. Uh, we may still see one or two other area scouts get hired. I don't know if Sadowski's going to be an area scout. I'm not sure if he's going to go from director of college scouting to area scout. He could. I don't know exactly what the title is going to be, but if Stratton's calling it an executive role, it seems to be a bit more than just kind of the uh, doing all that grunt work. So, and then of course you you know you do lose Rapriche and McNorton, so you may want to replace uh, have another addition there. So I could certainly see maybe someone as more of a true area scout for the South Southeast to replace Rick Reprise. Well, we had one last time of playing where's Waldo with Rick Reprise this past off season. Mm. So that's going to be a fun. little bit, that's going to be a little bit different because he was one of the ones that kind of real, real easy to, uh, 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 to spot there. I think he, he did not hide from the cameras. I don't <laughs> think the camera uh, loved Rick Reprise. It sure did there. So that, uh, that's interesting. And, uh, obviously kind of just more housekeeping on the back end, uh, for us nerds, uh, who like keeping track of that stuff there overall. All right. Good job on that. Thank you. So rest of OTAs, um, two's our skippers spoke with the media after getting signed. He had a day of practice with Pittsburgh on Thursday, just talked about working on his coverage and drops and that's all well and good, but two's are, they don't drop linebackers too often. It's been a while <laughs> since you've been with Pittsburgh, but uh, those guys don't drop. I forgot. I forgot. This is actually his third state with the team. I thought it was his second, but he had, you know, he'd been went back with Pittsburgh after getting claimed right. by the giants. And then he came back, I think later that year, early in 2020. So hopefully a third time is a charm for two star skipper. Yeah. And once again, I, I, I would like to see one other edge. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that he's back. I think that's a good move in this aspect that you get a, get a, get, get a guy that kind of knows what's going on back in that room and a guy that let's face it, where he, where he left off in that preseason, you, you did kind of have, have uh, a thought of maybe, maybe they found something here, but uh, uh, this is going to be, this is his last shot. I think he, you know, mm-hmm. if, if, if he washes out, 
uh, th- later on this summer, you'd have to think that that's going to be about it for him. So, uh, but I would like to see them add one other kind of more experienced guy to that room moving to, to the edge rusher room moving forward here. And we'll, we'll see if that ultimately happens here. Uh, all right. Things that other things that we kind of learned coming out of, uh, OTAs, Alex, uh, left to right offensive line. Yeah, I think it's about what we expected it would be uh, to start. And these things can obviously change and injury certainly can throw curveballs. but Dan Moore at left tackle, Kevin Dotson at left guard, Mason Cole at center, James Daniels at right guard, and Chuck Wilmer Corfo at right tackle with, I guess, some quasi-competition at left guard between Green and Kevin Dotson. But right now, it really seems to be Dotson's job to lose. And it, that, I, you know, I, I wonder how much of Kendrick Green we're going to see at center <laughs> the rest of the summer. Uh, it really... I, I think they have cut the cord maybe on that uh, uh, because look, if he is going to be your backup center, you know, you're going to have to see him during the preseason. Right. And to, to kind of hear, uh, and obviously it's still way early in this process to hear him, to, to, to hear kind of the, the, the frame quotes coming out of him. He's he, he don't care if he ever takes another snap at center again. Yeah, I think he just wants to play wherever that's best for him. And I'm sure he didn't love being thrown into the fire at center last year, barely ever doing it in college and was trying to deal with all these big nose tackles at a position he was pretty unfamiliar with. Uh, but if he's going to be that that true backup swing man, he's got to get reps at center. He's got to get reps at right guard. You can't right. just be the left guard. He's got to get work at all those places if you really want to be uh, a bad backup in Pittsburgh. You got to be versatile. You got to have experience at all three spots there. So I think he almost has to if he's not going to be a starter on this offensive line. Can James Daniels be your backup center or no? I mean, he could, but how many how much how many reps is he going to get there if he's your right guard the whole right. way through camp and he hasn't played much center? He was a right guard last year in Chicago. I think that's more of an emergency situation where if you really had to move somebody there on the fly, but he's not getting reps there. So you know, it's it's Hassenauer, it's Green, probably your top two guys right now. All right, of of the perceived top five guys right now, that being uh, Dan Moore, Kevin Dotson, Mason Cole, James Daniels, uh, Chikomo Corfor, which one are you concerned about the most? Um, I mean, I think there's just a lot of question marks overall, both individually and collectively. So sure. a lot of moving pieces, and so it's hard to pick out one name. I think Kevin Dotson is certainly under the microscope the most. You know, the talent's there. I think this guy can be a good player, a good run blocker, but it's a big year three for him. How to stand more looking year two, that's going to be a concern. And even Mason Cole, I mean, he's not going to be a top 10 center in all likelihood this year. So if you made me choose a name, I look at that left side of the line with Moore and Kevin Dotson, but really all these guys have to prove themselves, maybe except for a core for because you kind of know what you have in him. His ceiling certainly is not incredibly large, um, but everybody else is either new or needs to have a really good year, you know, w- with that reservation. I think my choice would be Mason Cole, and that might be because he's a guy that I know the least of, um, of, about right now. You know? Okay. Yeah, that's fair. He's a new guy. I mean, I think I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be an average center. His run blocking better than his pass pro, and I can live with that as long as he's a stabilizing force that is not bringing the all the peaks and valleys that Green rode last year. And again, I understand that's a tough circumstance for him to be in, but as long as he's just fine, I'm good with fine. All right. What else did we learn, quote unquote, maybe learn or think that we learned from coming out of six practices of OTAs? Again, it sounds like the Trubisky ran with the ones throughout OTAs, Rudolph as the two, Pickett as the three. That's basically the way I thought it would go. Um, Pickett's not going to be handed the keys from day one. He's going to have to earn it, and that's the way the Pittsburgh's model is. The veterans you know, get first crack, and the rookies have to work their way up. Unless you're Najee Harris, then you're just the guy right away. Um, but, I mean, that's not, to me, any earth-shattering or really even super important news. Uh, is uh, Benny Snell football still in maybe better standing than, than what maybe most people think. I think so. Partially due to the special teams value, like as a runner, I mean, he, there's very little there with Benny Snell. He's a plotter, generally speaking. And I know he's run behind some crap lines in his career. And so it's not all on him, but he is who he is, but he's going to have that value as that, you know, pretty core four phase special team guy that should, he should be the number three. He's not playing a lot offensively, but based on the current roster construction, he might be the number two. All right. Uh, you know, 
there just hasn't been enough. I mean, and they don't, do, you know, it's football in shorts. Uh, has there been anything else come out? Maybe about one of the undrafted rookies or anything, anything that's made, that's made you go, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe one or two things I've kind of read on Twitter about Miles Boykin, but you would expect a height, weight, speed guy like that to look good in shorts. Like he better look good in an environment like this. When mm. the pads come on is when really those guys get tested. When you're 6'4", 220, and you run 4'4", like he better look good in, in, in this environment. All right. Uh, anything else? Um, I, I think some of the versatility with the receivers sticking with that group, Calvin Austin made it a point of Freeman Jackson is really preaching that. And I know last year and really kind of in the post AB world, these guys have mixed and matched more than kind of your set, your X, your Z, your F. But I, I had a terrible take on this the other day and I'm just speculating. I wonder if one reason why I killed you was let go this past year, this off season was because of that lack of versatility because Pittsburgh really got stuck last year when Juju went down, they didn't have guys to play in the slot and Washington really couldn't see the field. He was blocked by Chase Claypool. So it sounds like maybe there's a bit more emphasis on being able to be versatile and move guys around under new wide receivers, coach Frisman Jackson. And that's not a bad thing, but uh, you, you still would expect Deontay to be your primary ex. Sure. Right. Sure, it's just exp- it's, it's other guys' it's experience. Maybe, as you said, Claypool plays a bit more in the slot this year, and just, just having the flexibility there so if and when injuries strike, you're not as stuck as this team seemed to be last year. Right, and, and, and you know, a guy, everybody, and, and right, rightfully so, you look at Calvin Austin and a guy, you kind of, okay, can, you know, what, what can he do? And, and having some optimism about him, uh, I, it's going to take a little time to get him I, you know, more into, into that slot role, I think. More, more than what what many people think. Now, do I think that you can carve out snaps for him uh, 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 early in the season? Yeah, I, 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 I do. But, you know, uh, I, it's just not going to happen, I don't think, overnight. You know, so I think you're going to have to have some. Can Anthony Miller make this team? You know, you you would have thought that that last season, the, the, the trials and the tribulations that 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 receiving core went through last season, you would have thought if Anthony Miller had had, you know, anything to offer that he would have gotten more time in that off. I mean, for God's sakes, Ray Ray McLeod, you know, hell of high water. They, they were, they were going to stick with him in that slot after Juju went down. Yeah, it was strange that Miller couldn't see the field. I'd love to know the reason. I know he was trying to catch the moving train. And I don't know if that was just a playbook trust confidence thing, but with, his, with Trubisky throwing him to him this year, um, he's got to make some noise. And, you know, uh, what's going to happen with, uh, with, 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 with Gunnar Olszewski? I mean, uh, is, it, is there a scenario where he doesn't make this team despite signing a two-year contract and get like $1.2 million guaranteed? I mean, if he doesn't, then who's your starting kick and punt returner? I mean, that was kind of his Austin job. be that guy? I mean, he's done a little bit of it. I don't think he actually did a lot of kicks. He did uh, some punt work. Uh, but as a rookie, do you fully trust that? I mean, I think Olszewski is not going to have a role offensively, but is he going to be that number five, number six guy who's also going to contribute on the coverage unit on special teams? I think there's a lot of value in that. And so I think he's got really good odds to make this team. All right, now something has crossed my mind, and and I I don't normally throw this kind of stuff out willy nilly or whatnot, but is there any scenario uh, whatsoever where a guy like Pickens, you know, with all this mixing and matching and learning positions, and is there any way that if, if Pickens shows you enough at the X position, do you and everybody stays healthy from now until uh, uh, and, and, until week one of the season? where you would remotely consider uh, trading Deontay Johnson. Now, obviously, if you did uh, another team, if another team was going to trade for Deontay Johnson, they would want permission ahead of time to talk to him and his agent about getting getting a, a long-term deal done because no team in their right mind is going to give you anything in, in the way of a draft pick on what could potentially be a one-year rental uh, for them. <laughs> So you you would obviously have to give a team permission to 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 talk to uh, uh, Deontay and his agent about getting a a long term extension done as as part of a a, a, a trade and sign type of deal. Uh, is there any plausibility to, to maybe something like that happening? I mean, 
A, and the question is, do you want to give him an extension? If the answer is no, then maybe that opens up a little bit more, but I just really don't see it happening. I don't think you're going to trade your best receiver for whoever's, you know, you're going to be a quarterback, a new rookie face, whatever the case is, and and give him that scenario. And then with Pickens, I, I like the Pickens pick. I think he's a really talented player. The value there was excellent. But I think this guy's going to have more of a learning curve than people think. He's 21. He barely played last year. He was an underclassman coming out of Georgia. This guy's going to have to adjust to the NFL and just get back to playing football. And I think people are overlooking that a little bit. So if hypothetically he's just tearing it up, I get your scenario there. But even still, um, you want to have depth. You want to have talent at receiver. This team's going to need its skill position guys to really create big plays. And so I'm not looking to subtract guys. And I, and I, and I obviously would not bet you know, the house on, on anything like that. I'm just trying to think from a, from a, from a plausibility standpoint is something like that plausible. It has crossed my mind, especially if this team does not have intentions on signing Deontay to a long-term deal. Let let me tell you, Deontay going to be a little hot if he doesn't get a deal by, by week one. Yeah, but he'll have to go out there and just play well. He has no choice but to play well to maximize his value so he can cash in next offseason. All right, I'm, I'm just throwing out, is there any level of plausibility to it, period? I really don't see it. I mean, I don't know what the incentive really would be. Deontay's not making a big stink right now. He, you know, he showed up for several OTA practices, so it's not like there's this giant – Debo Samuel type holdout or pay me or trade me kind of thing. So I just really don't see it happening. I mean, I, I'll pose the question though, just to, to run with a hypothetical, what would be his value? What would you get for him? Uh, I would like to think you could get a second for him. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a second. I'm trying to think. I mean, what are some comparable deals? Cause this receiver market's been pretty wild this off season. Um, you can't compare Tyreek or Devonte, and I mean, is he an AJ Brown type? He's probably is that the same know. value? I mean, Brown went for a first, but that was on draft night, right? I, 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 I wouldn't think. I would think. What did would, Hollywood go for? He went for a first too. I can't. I don't know if I can see Deontay getting a first. Yeah, I don't. I have. I mean, obviously, that's that. That'd be probably I mean, if you could. I, I just don't. I would think though that you would at least hold your ground on a second. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I the, just, the thing is, because if you don't sign him now and you, you lose him to free agency next year, yada, yada, uh, uh, the, the, the best that you're going to get back for him is a third round compensatory pick. And even that would not happen until 2024. Right. Right. And it's a late third round. It's one of the last last like five picks of the round. So it's almost like an early fourth. Right. And I mean, if he's, if he's going to be that disgruntled come uh, he's not going to be happy if he does not get a deal by week one. He is not going right, to but happy. what's I mean, all I care about is what is what is the consequence of that? Is he going to hold out? I mean, as long as uh, he shows he, up and no. work, he has he has to show up and work. I mean, he wants to right. get paid. You, you know, he's gonna he might be pissed, but you have no choice but to play well. And you said his motivation, right? And I, I still well, think a deal again, could I, get done. Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to. I would bet against it, and, I, and I've been in the boat for a while now. I'd bet against it happening. Uh, right, but I I think the point of this idea that they don't give second contracts to receivers. I just don't think that sits with me the way it sits with you. Okay. Because well, they, I almost they, wonder they, if they think that wide receiver is fungible, <laughs> but I mean, they, they paid a B they paid ward and I get some, some circumstances were a little bit different. They wanted to pay Burris. They gave, they gave him an offer, the same offer they took to New York. Um, they weren't going to pay all the young money crew. That's they could only really pay one of those guys. Like what receiver did they let get away willingly that they they you know was a really talented guy they should have resigned. Here's the thing too though moving forward now it's it, it, it's the guaranteed money aspect is going to be even more in 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 focus going forward, you know, uh I can't see I I don't think it'd be in Deontay's best interest to do a even if it was let's say a uh uh you know 20 million dollar new money average deal uh, if that's the old standard, you know, the guaranteed money is a signing bonus and that's it, take it or leave it, you know, uh, and, and, and go on to the assumption that we have a nice track record of paying out large portions of these big contracts. You know, I, I don't I don't know if that's going to be 
enough to get it done on his end. You know what I'm saying? Without having at least like, let's say the first two years of this thing fully guaranteed. Sure. No, I get the structure. There's going to be some hurdles there and the receiver market's really heated up this off season. There's no arguing that, but I just think, because I know some of the things you said is like on principle, they're not going to pay him, but I just don't really see where that principle is coming from. Okay. Well, it, I mean, it would, it would realistically kind of be the, be a first because even, even the first deal that uh, uh, Antonio Brown got, there was a whole different set of circumstances with that, you know, Sure. Uh, because he was facing restricted free agency uh, at at the time. You know, back then you you uh, the Steelers signed their rookies to three year deals, uh, uh, not in the first round, and instead of four. Obviously, the, that that new CBA corrected that aspect of it. They had they uh, they had uh, kind of cash that they had to spend, so to speak, if you will. Uh, after Mike Wallace not taking that deal, so really, I mean. Um, they were able to undershoot Antonio for all practical purposes. You know, it wasn't a top of the market deal back then, you know, whereas uh, a deal for Deontay is going to, uh, you would think unequivocally be a top, top 10 deal for wide receivers. Right. But I'm, I'm saying what receiver did they not retain that they didn't even try to retain? You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Because the, I mean, the idea look, is look, don't pay receiver Juju, second contract. Juju would have been gone last off season had they not done – Right, but, but he came back. I mean, right. that's ultimately he was retained, and it wasn't the big money deal, obviously, but he was resigned. But again, right. Burris to me is not an example because they tried to pay Burris. He just takes two to tango. He wanted to go to New York, catch more passes. That's his decision. Okay. They weren't going to pay the whole young money crew. They retained Ward. They still retain AB. They resigned Juju, et cetera. I mean, Holmes, you know, obviously with some of the off the field stuff, they ended up trading him. I just don't see an example of that super talented receiver they just let walk. All right. I mean, he's not going to accept a deal for less than 20 million, right? Would you think? I mean, it'll be in that range. I don't know exactly how you want to slice it. Is it 18? Is it 19? Is it 20? It's going to be a lot. And again, the receiver markets increased that price tag. So, I mean, I, I get that. But I'm just saying, you know, in terms of the principle of the matter, I think they'd be open to doing a deal. I mean, Omar Khan said it himself. You want to keep good players. You want to keep them in the building. To me, Dante Johnson is a good, a good player. Had a really good year last year, and you want to keep him around. All right, uh, Wilson. Well, obviously, that's going to be one of the main talking points um, uh, moving forward w- with him. Yeah, it's uh, it'll be one of the more interesting decisions of Omar Khan's you know early tenure because Minka is a decision, but there's almost not a decision. Like it's going to get done, he'll get paid, and and that's almost you know written in pen. Um, it's just a matter of waiting for the deadline to kind of create some movement there. But Deontay and, could go either way. And once again, I I don't you know. Deep, deep in my heart of hearts, do I think, you know, trade away of Deontay is going to happen? No, I just wonder if this might, if there's a level of plausibility in there somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just hard for me to, to get there to think about that. All right. Uh, anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I think that's it. We can get to some reader emails and close out today's show. All right. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, replacing to it emails here from Richard Jameson. Uh, in your emergency podcast on June 1st, you speculated that the six roster defensive linemen are already on the roster, but what do you see for the practice squad? Will the Steelers have a defensive lineman on the practice squad? Is there an undrafted rookie who now has the inside track to the practice squad? Are the Steelers likely to sign a free agent for the practice squad? Oh man, that's, that's way out there at, 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 at this point. And I mean, will they have a defensive lineman on on their practice squad? Absolutely, they will. Will they have even two of them? Probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, who those guys are going to be at this point, man, uh, spin the wheel. Sure. I mean, Mondo probably sticks around. Remember, you can put six, six veterans on your practice squad, too. They still don't have to be the rookie or the first year type of guys. And the practice squad got expanded. Are they doing 16 again? I think they're back to 16. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, Cause it was going to be 14. They, they kicked it back on the, under the old COVID rules. So yeah, you'll have Mondo probably. Um, and maybe someone else, Archer Bong's on this team as well. Somebody gets signed mid camp, you know, there'll be guys there. Right. Uh, that that's not, uh, you know, uh, obviously Richard, as we get further into this thing, we'll, we'll speculate more about uh, who, you know, who, who might be that, uh, uh, th- those two extra guys maybe on the practice squad there. Uh, Brandon writes in. Let's see here. Oh, he uh, he first he had a fo- he had a uh, an email then a follow up email. His first email was 
uh, defensive line possible names. Carl Nassib. Uh, why are people? Uh, yes, Carl Nassib, Nick Williams, Sheldon Richardson, Antoine Woods, Starlo to Laley, Brandon Williams. Uh, he says Woods is probably more of a nose, so X him off, and he's bounced around quite a bit. Star has fallen off quite a bit since his heyday, he says. Is Brandon Williams going to be willing to play on a, a Trey Turner deal, and is and is he a starting defensive end or better as a nose tackle? He says, seriously, I don't have any idea. Uh, he says the other names are not great, Bob. Uh, Carl Nassib is not a fit. In the uh, why people put Carl Nassib on the list, I do not know, for starters. Second, uh, three other guys you have on this list, uh, in addition to Nick Williams and Sheldon Richardson, who we've already talked about, uh, Antoine Woods, Starlo Tulele, and Brandon Williams are all really kind of nose tackle slash defensive tackle types. I, I, I don't see the value, at least in the current state of the roster, with Adams and Tyson Adewale, uh as why you would go after nose tackle defensive types. Yeah, Will, Williams is definitely a nose tackle from him in Baltimore. Um, he's a you know definitely like the one tech when they had him and Michael Pierce and guys like that. So he's not going to really be playing a lot of end for you. So I think, I mean, again, I don't want to be super hyper-focused on the two names we've talked about, but Williams and Richardson are the best scheme and economical and overall fits for Pittsburgh, if you ask me. Right, uh, so especially at this point of the offseason. Now, if you get into a situation where injuries happen, then, then you're probably – maybe looking at a different type of animal, you know, or, or at least from a, from a price standpoint there, but uh, you know, right out of the shoot, I've never gotten to all the Larry o o Ogan Jobies, especially uh, look, he's coming off of a, a foot injury. Uh, he had kind of a, a really expensive deal in place with the bears that the, the failed physical uh, uh, shot that down. Now, assuming that he got back from this injury, you would think that's still going to be the around the price point for him. Right. I mean, let's let's I don't think he's going to get a 40 billion deal here in June or whenever he gets cleared in July. I think he's going to take a one year deal, probably. All right. So let's say it was a one year deal. What is the is he looking at uh, what uh, what the guy in Tampa Bay just got a base value of around six million dollars and up to ten million dollars with Hicks? Yeah, I get what he's looking at. Right. I mean, the health is the big question here but yeah i think he's looking for something closer to akeem hicks all right well the steeder i i, I well I'm, where's my pin at so i can pop these balloons uh play the angry clown here uh the steeders are not going to do an up to contract so for all of you that continue worrying about the spilt milk with akeem hicks the steeders were not going to do a base value uh deal and then throw in another four million dollars of incentives on that now, if they could have gotten Hakeem Hicks at a one-year, six million dollar deal, maybe that would have happened, especially in light of of of, of the room with with to it. But even then, that that's kind of pushing the envelope to to a degree with with what they like to do on one-year deals. There, I would say that probably a, a one-year, six million dollar deal, however, would be it. I mean that that that's a ceiling. So if you could get a Assuming he could pass a physical Larry Ogan Joby at one year for a firm six million dollars, okay, uh, I could maybe see that happening. Other than that, you have to think that the Steelers would be angling at a two-year or a multi-year deal, and Larry Ogan Joby probably says, "The heck with that! Give me a one-year deal yeah. somewhere where I can show people that I'm still worth." the kind of deal that I was going to sign with the bears there. Right. Everybody, and then cash in next year with the same right, deal. Yeah. Right. Everybody wants to look at this only slanted at the Steelers side of things. Oh, well just get this guy on, uh, on, on this one year, $6 million deal or, or two year uh, at $6 million uh, per you have to look at it at the other side of what the players probably thinking as, as well too and then you have to go back and look at the way the Steelers normally do business you know with free agents and especially this this time of year there and none of that right now from where I'm standing matches up with Larry Ogan Joby landing landing with the Steelers yeah I think it's a fit from a player system standpoint but a financial standpoint a health standpoint are going to be the question marks there uh, but there are very few players signing multi-year deals right now if you're signing it's a one-year deal so you can try to prove yourself have a good year and then try to cash in next offseason especially when the caps expected to go up 
a fairly large amount for next uh, next year. And I get it. Yeah, Omar Khan's new and all like that. And and, and look, part of this learning process is as, as Alex and I move along uh, with this and, and the rest of us look at, at how maybe things might be different with the Steelers as opposed to the way they were with, Ke- uh, with, uh, with Kevin Cole. Remember, Khan was still the cap guy doing the yeah. contracts. So how much of the financial way that the Steelers have done business uh, all these years is going was dictated more by Colbert than it was Khan. You know, it's going to be pretty similar. Like this, but uh, when you were negotiating deals last year, you were talking to Omar Khan. You really weren't talking to Kevin Colbert. So you're still right. talking probably to the same dude. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think those principles are going to change too dramatically. And you know, I, one thing that I I preach a lot of times are really more behind closed doors with my with with guys like Alex and Matthew and and the rest of the guys is the whole hi- hierarchy thing. Uh, with the Steelers and, and and bringing in outsiders and keeping some level of the hierarchy uh, as far as average average yearly pay uh, in, in, in line and all like that. I, I really find it hard to believe that you're going to bring a guy in like Larry Ogan Joby or anybody for that matter off the street and instantly make them, let's say, the third highest paid defensive player on your roster uh, and the fourth highest paid player overall on, on, on your entire team just off the street because it's just a uh, look the, the Joe Hayden thing several years ago was a little bit of a different animal because a of the type player that you're you 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 were dealing with and the Steelers had a lot of uh, a lot of love for that kind of player and also that was a multi-year deal on top of it you know so it wasn't just a one-year seven million dollar you know, uh, 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 your deal. This is a multi-year investment with him. So if you could get Larry Ogan Joby to agree to a three-year, $18 million contract, which you're not, good luck with that. But if you could, then yeah, I could see something like like that happen. And then, oh yeah, lo and behold, he's, you know, your, your third or whatever highest paid defensive player uh, on the team. But I, I, I just don't see anything like that happen. I don't see the Steelers changing their stripes when it comes to the, the, the financial way of doing business. And all. Right. I do want to mention just not to, to take this off topic too terribly much, but in terms of front office, because I like to nerd out about the Steelers front office, uh, a name to watch for Col- Cole Marco is a name that I wrote about the other day on Steelers Depot. He's going to kind of be, I think, Khan's right-hand man when it comes to some of the salary cap stuff. It sounds like Khan's going to still handle that primarily, but he's going to have his plate pretty full. So I think some of that might get delegated to Cole Marco. He's been with the team for, I think this is Third year, he got hired to replace Samir Suleiman, who went to uh, David Tepper in Carolina. And so that's the guy just uh, maybe it might have some more influence on this team, Cole Marco. All right, let's answer one more here from Chris Lookhart, right? Saying, good Fridays. Good Friday, boys. I have a few questions. Will Pittsburgh get some kind of compensation pick for to it retiring? Uh, no. 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 Uh, I understand the free agency is probably the way they will go to fill his slot. But uh, can you think of any players that maybe they can trade for that make any sense? Have a great weekend, Chris. I think we addressed a lot of that already uh, throughout this podcast here. Uh, and uh, I know you say, I understand, Chris, you write, I understand the free agency is probably the way they go. Uh, I'll be a bit surprised they do anything uh, outside of maybe bringing back a Mason or, or a minimum salary guy, uh, a young player, maybe at this point to, 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 to fill that roster spot. Uh, I mean, could, could a guy like Nick, Nick Williams or, or, or Sheldon Richardson on the cheap uh, be added? Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to hold my breath, but I, I could see something like that happening more so than I could the Larry Ogan Jobies or, or these uh, uh, who's another name they're throwing out there. Sue or, yeah. or, 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 or anything, you know, all, all, all along those lines there. Uh, no, they don't get anything for uh, no compensation for stuff onto it retiring. Uh, none. Right. Um, yeah, I think my, my very short pithy answer to what the Steelers will do to replace the fun to it is less than you think, <laughs> less than what people are trying to make it out to be. Not what they want to hear, right? That's not going to be right. great for ratings, right? Yeah, we're not going to get a lot of clicks on that, but that's just kind of probably the reality there. And look, we, we always try to keep this as real as possible. Now, are occasionally, uh, are we surprised on occasion? Yeah, I mean, but it's, it's very, very few and far between. Uh, you know, unless injury happens at this point, God forbid that doesn't happen at all. Uh, uh, you know, that's that's the only way I can see 
you know, anything above, let's say a, a Sheldon Richardson or, 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 or Nick Williams. But I, I tell you right now, uncle Dave would be out there with a minimum, with a vet uh, benefit contract. I would have that faxed over to Nick Williams yesterday just to see if I could set the hook in that, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't think you're going to, I, I wouldn't get your hopes up of anything exciting happening. Uh, uh, Chris moving forward here and that, that, in, you know, Alex and I tried to, you know, I haven't gone deep on looking at kind of guys that they might be able to trade for and look, uh, as closer we get to week one of the season, maybe, a maybe somebody gets dumped, you know, the way say Joe Hayden did several years ago, and maybe, maybe something works out that way, but it's hard to see that far off, even though mm-hmm. we are already in June right now. Yeah. So again, there's, there'll be time to talk and think about that stuff. Once you get in the camp, so much will change and so much you think is set, won't be set and guys will surprise and disappoint. So I'm not thinking too much about that stuff right now. Just thinking about the here and now. All right. Uh, Hank, uh, Hank has an idea for a video here of, about Devin Bush and, uh, I don't know. Uh, he says, uh, he wants to see a video breakdown that shows, Devin Bush and his true performance was in early in his career prior to ACL and, and what is the best we can expect from him two years removed uh, from the injury. I don't know if that's something that we want to tackle going back a couple of years at this point uh, here, but I, you know, obviously Devin Bush uh, is, is, is in the Steelers plans in 2022 and man, you hope you see a lot better player than you saw in 2021, plain and simple. Sure. He needs it as much as anybody needs it on this roster right now. The circumstances, even without to it, I think are set up for him to be in a better place, but ultimately he's got to play better and just do the job. And so right. that that's what it comes down to. Uh, so I don't know if, I don't know, maybe at some point uh, one of these guys will hit a video on, 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 on Devin Bush and maybe go back to his rookie season or something along those lines uh, uh, there. But uh, we'll, we'll see how play. the off season gets long. Uh, starting after uh, mandatory mini camp, so we'll, we'll we'll see what plays out there. Yeah. Eh? It does. I'll have an article. Speaking of the, the trying to find stuff to write about, uh, article tomorrow on uh, well, I think one of your maybe I don't know if it's a crush of yours, but somebody you, you seem to like, Ray Penny. I have an article mm. on Ray Penny All right. uh, tomorrow. We're starting a new series: obscure Steelers touchdowns. Ray Penny had two touchdowns in his career. Did you know that? I didn't know that. One was so on a fake field goal, wasn't it? No, uh, both were a uh, tackle eligible. Okay, uh, but they were similar to what you're getting at. Yeah, okay. kind of like a little trickery there. So we're recapping Ray Penny's touchdowns tomorrow. All right, all right. Look forward to that. Uh, okay. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right navigational bar. Also, if you want an ad free version of the site, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the ad free button up right navigational bar. Twenty five dollars for uh, you can have an ad free version for a year uh, on the site there. Alex and I, barring something major happening and us needing to have another emergency podcast. Uh, I guess the plan is for us to be back on Tuesday. Correct, Alex? Right. We will have our YouTube live stream Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So you can hang out with us then as well. All right. Uh, sounds good then. So uh, 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 plan to hear from us uh, Tuesday on the podcast uh, unless something changes there. As always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.